Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Conversation with Major General Charlie Cleveland. Before we begin, we want to share a video from our sponsor, SAIC. Now, please welcome INSA Executive Vice President John Doyen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our final program of the calendar year. We're pleased this morning to welcome one of our community's top leaders. Before we begin, let me run through some of the housekeeping notes. First, we'd like to make this session as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen. We have over 500 attendees this morning, so that's a lot of people. We'll try to get to as many questions uh, as we can with the time we have. Second, we're pleased to welcome members of the press to today's call. So this is a reminder that today's session is on the record. And finally, I'd like to th uh, thank our sponsor, SAIC, for their critical support of this program. We simply could not deliver this type of programming uh, without the support of our partners. Now I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Lou Messing. Lou is Vice President of Programs at SAIC and he'll introduce our speaker. Lou, over to you. Hey, thank you, John. We're, we're making a habit of this, I guess. Uh, I would like to thank INSA for hosting this program and for all the work they've done to keep our community connected this year. Very important work and just outstanding execution, so thank you. SAIC is a proud supporter of INSA and has been supporting the intelligence community mission for over 50 years now. SAIC is intently focused on digital and analytic transformation and is spending a lot of time with our customers uh, thinking about how we can secure and then leverage data that is now more than ever co-located and available to our analysts. How to accelerate cross-domain data integration and emerging analytic techniques such as object-based production or activity-based intelligence through semantic brokers, ontologies, or other frameworks, and building relationships with academia and commercial technology providers to enable faster, cheaper delivery of leading-edge capabilities that address specific technology gaps. I know that NGA is working on some of these same innovations and many others, and I'm sure we'll get some insight into where those are heading this morning. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Major General Charles Cleveland. Major General uh, Charles Cleveland became the Associate Director of Operations for the NGA in January of 2019. In this capacity, he oversees the NGA's worldwide operational support and the execution of the agency's mission across the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. Previously, he served as Vice Director for Intelligence Joint Staff, where he supported the intelligence needs of Joint Chiefs, Combatant Commands, and the Secretary of Defense. A career military intelligence officer, his assignments have included the 82nd Airborne Division, the 75th Ranger Regiment, the U.S. Army Office of Military Support, and the Joint Special Operations Command. Quite an impressive career. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you. Hey, good morning, uh, everybody, and my sincere thanks for being a part of this, and uh, my thanks first off to INSA, of course, uh, as well as to SAIC, and uh, and frankly, this is just a great opportunity for NGA uh, to get up and, and represent the direction we're going, uh, and also, I'm just thrilled to, uh, to see the number of people who are uh, attending, and quite honestly, I see a number of colleagues, uh, I see a number of friends, but also a number of mentors, and so I know that puts a lot of the pressure on. And, uh, you know, John, if I could just touch base with you and make sure that you can see me uh, okay with everything. I'm having a little bit of problem on the visual. Ah, Charlie, everything's good. Uh, we see you fine. Uh, we read you loud and clear. 
And I also would like to extend my uh, thanks to you for joining us this morning. We're really interested to talk with you today about the challenges and priorities uh, for NGA uh, as you look ahead to the new year and beyond. And um, perhaps a good, good starting point uh, to kick off the discussion uh, is a little bit, uh, if you could tell us about your role right now at NGA, as uh, I believe your title is the Associate Director of Operations and how, you know, the, what duties and responsibilities uh, uh, you're responsible for and how that kind of fits into the overall leadership uh, structure at, at NGA. Absolutely. Yeah, John. The, uh, the role that I'm in right now is, as you noted, I'm the Director of Operations uh, for NGA, and it's a relatively new uh, role on uh, about three or four years uh, old, uh, if that. And the real focus of it is to try and really integrate the operations of our entire agency uh, and focus them on the direction that the director is, is, is leading us. Uh, as many are aware, we now have a total of four associate directors. We have one for support. Uh, we have one for our enterprise, we have one for uh, operations, and then we also have one for our capabilities. And the intent behind those is that each of these associate directors will have the role to integrate uh, our agency efforts uh, in those particular areas. And so, uh, of course, they line up very well right now to our strategic direction and the direction that Vice Admiral Bob Sharp uh, is moving us towards. And those pillars really include our people, uh, number one, uh, our partnerships, number two, uh, mission today, number three, and mission tomorrow, number four. And so as we look at the associate directors, uh, the intent is that our support associate director will really be focused on our people. Uh, our enterprise, of course, focused on our partnerships, operations focused on mission today, and then capabilities focused on mission tomorrow. And so, the four of us really work very closely, of course, with our chief of staff, uh, our deputy director, Dr. Stacy Dixon, and ultimately that forms our executive committee, and that forms really the strategic leadership uh, of the agency uh, as we move forward. Yeah, well, I think every many of the folks online and others who've worked with you know NGA is a really strong leadership team, and it's uh, great to have uh, see that they're running this important mission. Um, can you tell me, as you look look out ahead, what are your major challenges that you're facing in the new year? What are and what sure. are your priorities? Yeah, in fact, uh, John, let me spend just a couple of minutes talking about the direction the agency is going because we really do think it's an important time for us. And as we as we look at the direction we're going, uh, frankly, you hear the following phrase so much that it almost sounds a little bit cliche, and at times it's getting lost in static but we are absolutely focused on our pivot to great power competition. Um, that is not a priority, that is the priority for us uh, as we move forward. And again, you hear that throughout the, uh, the community quite a bit, but from a specific GeoInt standpoint and from an NGA standpoint, we really do think that we are at a point right now, uh, an inflection point, and we think we're on the cusp of both an evolution really in national security affairs, as well as a revolution in GON and the discipline of GON. So as we start and we look at that evolution, obviously uh, we are moving collectively from the days of counterterrorism into great power competition. And quite honestly, all that that entails. But we also know that there are these new domains that are opening up, these war fighting domains and specifically cyber and space. And of course, there's been a tremendous amount of energy put into both of those topics for many years, but we now see both of those domains really coming to the forefront. And we think at NGA, we have a significant role uh, in both of those. And then finally, we're also watching the way of war evolve. And at this point, all of the services are spending a great deal of time focused on what their future war fighting strategies and capabilities uh, are going to be. And of course, the joint staff is now stitching this together uh, in more of a joint effort. And while there are some differences, what is absolutely common to all of them is all of those theories and, and uh, the way that they're all heading really is based on essentially uh, long range sensing and long range targeting. And each of the services absolutely envisions being able to use national level assets to provide very, very uh, tactical support to their warfighting elements. And so we do think that we've got a tremendous role in being able to support uh, the direction that, uh, that the American military is moving. From a strictly geoint standpoint, mm -hmm. of course, we do think that we're in the midst 
really of a revolution right now. And specifically, and this audience knows it uh, as well as anybody, but the explosion of commercial capabilities uh, has really just changed uh, the entire opportunity for geo. And we're soon moving to a point where we think essentially every part of the planet will be imaged on a on a daily basis. And so we also then look at all that data coming in and we struggle and we think about the opportunity though with how to handle all of that data. And that really leads into the second revolutionary piece, which is the use of machines and artificial intelligence and being able to further empower uh, our humans with all that can be brought to bear. But you know, we do say that in, in a time right now where historically the United States has had the corner on the market as it, po as it pertains to, to our business. And of course, that's no longer the case. We know that our adversaries really do have some significant capabilities and they are in many ways beginning to close the gap on us. And so as we move forward, John, we really do think that um, uh, frankly, we are not going to be able to compete. We are not gonna be able to do what we need to be doing by just simply trying to do what we're doing yesterday just a little bit faster or just a little more efficiently or by adding in a few additional uh, people to work it. We really do think that we've got to adjust uh, the direction that we're going. And okay. so to that end, um, that has really kind of prompted the agency about 18 months or so ago to start trying to accelerate our pivot towards this great power competition. And of course, NGA was already on that direction since the national defense strategy was signed, since the national security strategy was was uh, issued. And so NGA has already been moving in this direction. But what we really realized is we've got to look for ways to accelerate our direction. And so that's started an effort that ultimately concluded in the spring uh, where Vice Admiral Sharp published his director's intent. And the director intent really is his direction to our agency to make this pivot uh, over to great power competition. And it features what we refer to as the moonshot. And the moonshot is not, uh, it's not an acronym. It doesn't really stand for anything. It's just a reference back to Kennedy's uh, moonshot in the 1960s. And it really, what resonates with us is it was essentially an operational, very difficult goal to achieve that our nation could understand and get behind. And so as we as an agency started to look at how can we best rally our team to be able to move in the same direction, we really started looking for uh, something that would be that concrete operational goal that everybody could know and everybody could understand that it would allow us to organize what we're doing, to prioritize what we're doing, and then ultimately to be able to measure, are we making progress uh, towards that? And as we, as we thought through that effort, we were looking for essentially that beacon uh, in the distance that all of us could see and all of us could move towards uh, together. But as again, we, as we did think through that, we were also looking for where can we best provide that GeoInt competitive advantage? What is the area where we think GeoInt should be providing 51%, if you will, of the effort and leading the effort? And ultimately what we arrived on, and many of you have read it already, is our moonshot statement, which is holding at risk the strategic uh, capabilities that our adversaries use to project power and also to threaten the United States. And as you think that through, of course, there's clearly a military component to it. And there are clearly the capabilities that we're all familiar with it being missile systems, being aircraft, being submarines, et cetera, and being able to maintain custody and have persistence on those things. But we also know that our adversaries use uh, their economy to project a tremendous amount of power too. And so we, we feel equally strong that we've got to be able to observe and track the things that our adversaries use to drive their economies and to be able to move forward. And then the final piece, of course, is we know our adversaries use their information capabilities. Mm -hmm. And we believe that we've got a role in being able to treat or to, to track the powers that, that execute that. But we think we've also got a role in being able to arm our policymakers and our decision makers and our military commanders with information that will help them compete in the information environment. And we think we've got to do that quickly. And so the idea of holding at risk though, it's broader really than just being able to have persistence and just being able to observe. What we've got to do is we've got to connect that loop of information back into the hands of somebody who's gonna do something with it. That completes the cycle for holding at risk. And so that really leads us into the efforts that we're working to accelerate our sensor to decision maker and our sensor to shooter 
uh, efforts as we move forward uh, on all of that. Okay. And again, ultimately, that consists of our moonshot, John, and that yeah. is our priority. Well, that's a lot. That's a lot there. So you've got the pivot to great powers, commercial imagery issues, uh, working with your industry partners, data, AI, uh, a moonshot. Uh, sounds like you've got a, a pretty uh, busy year ahead. But going back to the pivot for a moment, um, I did want to ask, and we we actually have a question in about this already, uh, which is a reminder to folks: if you if you have questions, please do send them in. Uh, and with the uh, the question is with or regarding great power competition uh, with adversaries like Russia and China, uh, you know, why is why is you know what's the difference? What why are different geoint challenges with these adversaries uh, versus say you know post 9/11 uh, era? Isn't it just all long range sensing? Sure, I, we we think that the challenges are frankly somewhat different. Um, because of the scope and the capability of what our adversaries have. As we look across the last 20 years, and, and I'm sure, and I know many up on uh, today's uh, seminar uh, had deep, deep uh, ties and, and parts of it. At many times, um, the focus was on tracking the individual human at a given time and being able to combine all of our intelligence disciplines. And our teammates who really excelled in this and who really um, uh, were trailblazers in terms of developing new techniques, our tactics, techniques, and procedures, developing new efforts, we believe that those individuals will be the same people that lead us into the future. But I think the key difference, John, is the scope and the scale of being able to follow what our adversaries are doing. And then also understanding that our adversaries are very sophisticated when it comes to also trying to uh, disguise what they're doing and to deceive what they're doing. And so we think that um, fundamentally uh, to be able to hold at risk those capabilities is gonna require this dramatic and significant effort that leads us into this revolution that we mentioned earlier, in particular, uh, the use uh, really of machines and machine learning to be able to further enable uh, our people. Okay, and we uh, just have another question, and this is one from someone who's named Sue, Sue Gordon, and the question is, uh, good morning, uh, General, and she has a moonshot question. How does your moonshot uh, intersect with other elements of the national security community in accomplishing the stated goal of holding at risk uh, um, our adversaries? Um, you know, you don't have to do it by yourself. Uh, how, how does that fit into an overall national approach? Sure. Of course, there's no such thing as an easy question from Sue Gordon, and I'm grateful that uh, that she took the time today uh, and uh, and really look forward to, to following up. But Sue, strictly from a military standpoint, uh, that one's a little bit uh, easier to touch base. As I mentioned earlier, each of the services uh, and really the joint force are moving towards this idea of being able to dramatically accelerate their targeting capabilities. And so as we look at holding at risk the types of capabilities that our adversaries have, being able to use these national capabilities to support very tactical operations, we think first off uh, in, the, in the role of collection orchestration and being able to um, help synchronize uh, what the broader community is doing uh, to be able to support those specific uh, to be able to sp support those specific warfighters, and then to rapidly get that information back into those hands. We also do believe very um, strongly that our success is going to be based in large part on a lot of modeling as we go into the future, and a lot of tipping and queuing between the various ends. And so as we work very closely with the SIGINT community, uh, already we are moving in that direction, and we are modeling, and we do tip and queue so that one type of discipline or one int tips the GeoInt constellation and is then able to, uh, to rapidly shift uh, and support that. We think that will expand. We think that will continue um, uh, and really grow and, and really have a dramatic uh, impact. Then as we look at some of the, the policy rel related questions, so we think that this also supports the direction that the policymakers are constantly asking about, about overall the status of these strategic capabilities and then the ability to inform our policymakers uh, and arm them to be able to compete in that information environment. And much like on the military side, 
we really do think that that is going to be based on a very strong tipping and queuing uh, aspect with uh, with our partners in the SIGINT community, to a degree the open source community, and certainly to a degree the HUMIC community. Thank you. And uh, um, a little one more thing on the moonshot. I saw recently NGA had a press release regarding a thing called the Moonshot Moon <laughs> Moonshot Moonshot <laughs> Labs. Uh, and the Moonshot Labs uh, are is are going to be uh, stood up out in the St. Louis area. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about about that and give us a backstory, uh, what you're trying to do there? Sure. So in fact, the Moonshine Labs, as I think you're going down that path, that may be something we explore in the future, John, but, uh, okay. but for right now, we are focused, of course, on the Moonshot Labs uh, in St. Louis. And as many know, St. Louis is really becoming a significant hub and center uh, of geo and excellence. And there are a number of efforts and activities that the community there is focusing on, that they're investing in, uh, and that they, are, that they are moving towards. And so, of course, we've got a significant presence in St. Louis. That's going to uh, be sustained and frankly, we think improved as we move into our new facility that should be completed in 2025. And so what we wanted to do was provide a forum, a space, an area within St. Louis where we could bring together uh, the best of the capabilities there and frankly, work through, uh, work through programming, work through a number of data opportunities, just find another location where we could get all of the experts uh, in one area in an unclassified space and be able to explore and partner. And you know, on, on the point of partnerships, that's one of the things our, uh, our director really emphasizes is we do fully realize that moving forward, we cannot do this ourselves. We've absolutely gotta be linked in incredibly closely with our partners. And in some instances, those partners are other members of the intelligence community. In some instances, those partners are uh, allies. Uh, they are foreign countries and they are people that we work with very closely. And then in many instances, our partnership with industry uh, and then also academia uh, is really going to be what we think propels us forward. And so Moonshot Labs is essentially another deposit into the down payment on how we can better partner with industry uh, and how we can better move in the direction together. That sounds pretty interesting. You know, many of our INSA members, of course, are industry as well as academia. Um, and I'm curious uh, if you wanted to participate in the, the Moonshot Labs, what, what could you expect if you were, say, a small, uh, a small uh, uh, startup company with some technology and you wanted to participate in NGA's Moonshot Labs? Sure, I, I think what you could expect, and again, it's relatively new. We're a month, month and a half into, uh, into moving on it. But I think what you could uh, expect is really a forum, really an environment, uh, really kind of a space to come together, to understand the direction that we as an agency are trying to go. And, and again, you know, using uh, today as an opportunity, we really want to be able to, to advertise and communicate, here's what's important to our agency, uh, and here's the direction that we are trying to move. Um, and uh, what I think they could expect is first off an opportunity to really develop a shared understanding of the director's vision and where we're trying to go. And then also an opportunity uh, to, to bring to that forum specific solutions to hopefully specific problems. Of course, uh, no one activity is gonna solve uh, the entire issue, but what we'd like to be able to do is expose, here's where we're trying to go, and then receive from, from partners, here are some specific solutions to some very specific problems that we think you're working on. Okay. Hey, shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about looking back, uh, we're at the end of the calendar year, looking back at 2020, which has been a difficult year for all of us uh, with the pandemic. And um, we've all had uh, in the workplace, we've of course had uh, uh, challenges to meet and face. And so I'm, I'm curious, um, can you talk, uh, we have a question in uh, from a gentleman named Robert Ashley, who says, can you talk about lessons learned on operating from the, in the unclassified workspace now and, and into the future? Sure. Uh, to General Ashley, congratulations again, sir, on your retirement. I hope you that you and Barb are, are just having a, a wonderful time as you move into the holiday season and looking forward to, to spending time with the kids and the grandkids and, and everything along those lines. And, and I do look forward to, to, to talking soon. Um, 
as it pertains to, to COVID and the way that our agencies responded, uh, we're very proud uh, of the steps and the, and the direction that we've taken. Of course, last March, when COVID uh, really uh, came to the United States, I think collectively we're all in the, the same effort to essentially get our people uh, out of our workspaces because our number one priority was let's keep our people safe while also trying to sustain uh, our most important national missions. And so we did spend effort and time in trying to essentially get people back home, uh, identify what are the priorities that we need to sustain and then moving forward. But I think within a matter of weeks, really uh, Vice Admiral Sharp and Dr. Dixon really kind of hit the, the conclusion that this crisis also presents us with an opportunity and that there was really an opportunity to in some way start reshaping the way we do work and frankly, start reimagining uh, the way we do work. And so that effort started off first off with, frankly, just kind of intent and guidance from the director, which was out to our teams um, to go forth and look for ways that we could conduct meaningful telework and look for ways that we could collectively figure out how to continue our, our role and our responsibilities um, from these telework locations. The next step in all of that was our CIOT team led by uh, Mark Andrus just really did some extraordinary work to help enable our workforce. And in a very short time, we went from about 300 uh, teleworkers up to over 8,000. They were also able to increase uh, the number of phone lines we have. They were able to uh, set up a number of opportunities for our director to literally get in front of our entire agency on an unclass forum so that he could communicate directly and help further describe what was happening with our agency, the direction we were going and what he was trying to accomplish. And I think that foundation, John, really did set the tone and the direction and it unleashed the potential uh, of our tremendous workforce. And what we really found was our workforce just coming up with extraordinary ways to continue to get work done uh, in this telework environment and to come up with new ways uh, of doing that. Uh, and that's not only just from the operational side, also from the administrative side. We found that a number of our, our efforts and procedures were, uh, were really up on the high side. And so we took a number of steps to, to ease that work and get that on to the, to the unclassified side as well. But from a, from a strictly mission standpoint, what we found is we were able to do quite a bit of our foundation work uh, on the unclassified networks and be able to, to sustain and ensure that high quality that we've always provided. Uh, we found that we've been able to do some level of production uh, on the unclassified network as well. And that speaks to being able to further feed the information environment and being able to further uh, provide our policymakers with information that they need. Now, I say all that, and as we move forward, uh, our director was pretty clear that if we come back from, from COVID and we go back to doing exactly what we were doing before, then we will have collectively failed. And so he is leading an initiative right now to again reimagine from a more permanent standpoint how we conduct our business and how we conduct our work. At the end of the day, we are still an intelligence agency. And at the end of the day, a bulk of our work is done on the classified systems for all the right reasons. And of course, that will be sustained. But we do think that we can probably become uh, more efficient and hopefully more effective as well by continuing to look at every aspect of what we're doing and trying to determine where can we where can we use our telework capabilities and, and how can we reimagine how we're doing this work? Thank you. Hey, uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, we have a question in uh, from Ian Harvey who asks: Given the current administration's focus on space and growing mm -hmm. commercial capabilities, how has the NRO and GA relationship changed over the past few years, and where do you see it going in the future? Sure. The NRO NGA rate relationship, uh, in our view, is absolutely critical to everything we do. We are partnered throughout, and it starts at the top. Uh, and Director Scalise and Director Sharp um, spend an awful lot of time together. Uh, they have both made a concerted effort to make sure that our two agencies uh, are linked together uh, at every aspect. And I think most on this forum understand the difference. And of course, uh, NRO is, is running our national constellation. And of course, NGA uh, benefits from that constellation by being able to do the geoint work off of all of that. But 
we will be successful as NRO is successful and NRO will be successful as we are successful. And so we really do believe that that relationship is critical to everything that we do. As it pertains to, again, this, this domain of space and the direction we're going, we think that we've got a significant role in that area and we're investing in that uh, in space right now. And when I say investing, uh, as we know, it's not just from a financial resource, it's from a human resource standpoint and from a time standpoint. So we've already put uh, a team, uh, one of our NGA support teams in NST, they are out at Spacecom. They've been out there now for over a year since before Spacecom officially stood up. Uh, we have dedicated a new line of business within our within our workflows to, to combine a number of space efforts and make sure they are uh, in really one governance structure. Uh, we are looking to invest in the coming years further in our capabilities. And then of course, we're now expanding our relationships with Space Force. And in fact, uh, I literally was was just up last week with your speaker next, one, mm -hmm. uh, next month, Major, uh, Lee, or Major General Leah Lauterbach. And she and I had an opportunity to synchronize uh, and, and talk through our way forward. And so what we think our future will look like is really a tremendous uh, focus. Uh, obviously, we've done a lot of work uh, on the terrestrial aspect, but we think there's a, there is a lot of room for growth for us uh, in the on-orbit area, uh, as well as even from a foundation standpoint, and trying to figure out how we can best contribute uh, to these larger efforts. To be able to do that, we think that we've got to be embedded with the people uh, who are conducting the specifics of the space work. So be it NRO, uh, be it Spacecom, and then ultimately Space Force uh, as we move forward. Um, okay, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of interest in Spacecom and Space Force, a number of questions, and I think that uh, hit most of the, the issues that people have been, been uh, asking. Um, let's switch over now and uh, a little bit to something you mentioned previously, which was the AI machine learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question in uh, from Tony Cothran. And he says, um, you know, what is being done uh, or needs to be done to get your workforce and analysts and technicians ready for and truly optimizing AI ML technologies and new capabilities to get more geoint to more customers more quickly? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, Tony. I mean, that's just, uh, you hit on the, the key to what we think the future will be. Um, you know, before I touch on the specifics of that, I, I did just want to touch on one other place regarding the direction we're going. And as we went through this effort to, to look for ways to accelerate our efforts to the great power competition, and we developed the, uh, the concept of the moonshot, uh, again, to serve is that concrete operational objective. One of the other things that we really tried to take a look at was what are the functions and the capabilities that our agency absolutely has to be able to do uh, to be able to support this, this pivot towards great power competition. And again, if, if you've had the chance to read the director's intent, uh, he does talk about it in there. Uh, the first off is really having assured positioning, navigation, timing, and targeting fundamentally investing in that foundational infrastructure. Uh, number two for us is, and these are not in priority because they're all in, imperative, but number two is the accelerated uh, tar uh, tasking orchestration and being able to, to move at the speed we need to, leaving behind this very linear, uh, very deliberate, very uh, slow process for collection orchestration. Uh, number three, of course, really does for us deal with data and data management. Uh, and then I'll touch on that. And then finally, uh, it's really our analytic workflow modernization. And Tony, for us, this is an imperative for us. It is being able to introduce artificial intelligence and machine learning into what we're doing. And as many of you know, we're already deep into that. We already have a number of efforts underway uh, that are paying off and that are, that are showing promise. But again, the scale of this uh, is just dramatic. Uh, in some part, what we're spending an awful lot of time uh, doing is in many ways just really capturing and cataloging uh, and tagging uh, parts of images to make sure that we can feed that into uh, into the larger system. A big part of it for us that we have discovered is we've got to do to take work on standardizing in some ways our data and making sure that our data uh, is really not only understandable but accessible by our entire workforce uh, so that they can be using. But ultimately, Tony, I think the direction we see ourselves going, and again. This is not just PowerPoint slide deep. We're already making steps in this direction and we're already seeing some benefit and some in areas, some, some real benefit. 
uh, frankly, with having uh, automatic reporting uh, on a number of things that we watch. Again, switching then into uh, to automatic uh, tipping and queuing. And ultimately, and many of you know Sue Calwood, our director of analysis, she, she describes it very well, but we want to be able to move our analyst workforce uh, really from focusing on uh, kind of the known knowns to shifting that, uh, that paradigm to, so that they have time to think and they have time to work on the unknown unknowns. And frankly, we want those machines to be able to take care of, of things uh, that machines should be taken care of. So of course we can get uh, our team focused on really the, the thoughtful efforts. I hope that answers the question, Tony, but it really, it really speaks to, to the future of the organization. Okay, here's a question a little bit related to that, uh, Charlie, that uh, asks, uh, points out that, you know, as we know, many agencies within the IC are outlining their respective multi-cloud strategies to better support mission. Um, can you share some information uh, when NG, uh, NGA will make more information available to industry on this and speak to the NGA strategic intent of a multi-cloud strategy, for example, for AI and machine learning? Sure. Um, first off, John, I probably won't do it justice. And so uh, <laughs> let me just give you an appetizer and a teaser, uh -huh. uh, and then a, a promissory note to follow up with those who can really speak to it uh, in, in dramatic detail. Uh, also, during this time of COVID, not only did we uh, publish our director's intent, but we also uh, in we published our NGA tech strategy. And it really speaks to a number of things uh, that, the, that the question uh, kind of touches on. Um, quite obviously, we, we genuinely believe that data is going to be the lifeblood of everything uh, that we are doing in the future. If we are going to be data driven and, and all that goes with that, that data, again, has got to be uh, uh, managed, of course, but it's also got to be accessible. And when I say accessible, that does not just mean, you know, to within the hallways of NGA. I mentioned earlier the value of our partnerships, uh, having that data accessible um with our partners uh, again our allied partners uh, as well as our industry partners uh, will be one of the driving things uh, that we need to do i unfortunately don't have a good binary answer for you in terms of when that point will be and, and how that that switch will be switched on I, I think the truth of the matter is right now we already do expose quite a bit of our data uh, to industry partners in some areas but i think as we move forward together understanding that there are still, of course, security risks, and we have to assure uh, that that information is protected. Uh, I think as we move forward, uh, we will be able to expose more and more of that and share more of that. But again, I go back to places, uh, as John mentioned earlier, to, to be at Moonshot Labs, to be at to a number of our other partnerships and, and the other forums where we have the chance to bring uh, leaders in this community together. We think that those will be opportunities to further expand and share that. Okay. Hey, thinking about data um, makes me look at a question we have here from Mark Quantic with uh, Babel Street, and it's about open source intelligence. And he asks, how do you know how do you envision NGA using and integrating open source intelligence uh, with your current operations uh, and your um, I guess you have an operations center called the Time Dominant Operations Center. We do. Uh, and Mark, uh, again, great to know that you're you're up today, Mark. Another another mentor for me uh, for many years, and so of course that just increases the pressure uh, in many ways. But uh, I would tell you, Mark, um, right now. In many ways, we are already using a tremendous amount of open source uh, data, not only in our T doc, but also in our in our larger production uh, chains. And in many ways, Mark uh, was probably one of the people who started this. He held this position. In fact, was really the first person to hold the position that I'm in today uh, years ago and was really a bit of a pioneer uh, on this effort. But Mark, we do maintain a capability within our TDOC that is constantly monitoring, but also producing uh, open source uh, information and trying to produce at the open source level. We are trying to increasingly put uh, open source analysts into our various uh, ge geographic and functional production chains so that they can introduce their information. 
And I have to say, uh, before I came to NGI, I, na I naively thought that open source was just frankly kind of reading the press. And in many ways at NGA, the aperture is much larger because it, it, it really does open up the playing field to all of the commercial capabilities uh, that we, we get from on orbit, as well as all the commercial capabilities and services uh, that come to NGA. And so we think harnessing that information being able to get that and introducing it into how we go about uh, assessing and analyzing a, a particular target set, open source is gonna be key to it. So uh, I guess to summarize, Mark, we, we already have taken steps in that direction. We've got a capability specifically within our TDOC and we think that that is uh, a growing part of what our portfolio is going to include, particularly as we reimagine and we, we come out of this COVID time and we think about how can we how can we introduce the lessons that we've learned during COVID and telework and all those things back into our larger uh, production chain? The final piece that I would say on that, Mark, too, is, and I've touched on it a couple of times, but we do strongly believe, because we also have a requirement and a demand signal from a number of our partners, to be able to produce information that our policymakers can use in the information space and that they can use to, to compete um, during these information uh, engagements that we have with our adversaries. And we think we've got a big role in that and a lot of the open source will help us uh, be able to further uh, empower our policymakers with that type of information. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and I'll let this uh, the final question be from Marcel Letra. Uh, at Lockheed, who asked, what is the one thing you wish you could wave a magic wand uh, and fix across the IC? Yeah, again, uh, this this is uh, the pressure builds. Marcel, another, uh, not only a mentor for me, but a, but a friend uh, in many ways. And so, you know, Marcel, I, I think we've probably talked about this a couple of times. I don't know that there's one thing that I would describe as completely broken. I think I would probably describe it as things I would like to further enhance and further improve. And for me, that really is the broader integration of the intelligence community, both the, the defense intelligence enterprise as well as the, the broader intelligence community. And I think we all, uh, many of us come um, you know, to this point uh, in history with again 20 years of having worked out forward in small little joint interagency task forces and small little jocks. We've seen the transition at the combatant commands into the JIOC structure. Uh, we see it at a couple of the national agencies where they've moved to the concept of mission centers. And fundamentally, um, if I could wave the magic wand and accelerate us, I would look for ways to better integrate um, uh, across uh, our agency in the mind's eye picture, which of course is, is not completely doable in the Beltway or in CONUS, uh, but the mind's eye picture uh, is really kind of based in many ways on the success we had against very tactical problems, but having a kind of that whole of IC uh, focus there. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think as we move forward on that, uh, that'll be certainly the direction that, that we try and drive. We fully realize we can't just do GeoInt for the sake of GeoInt. Um, anything that we do for it to be of value, it's got to be valued by our partners. And that information has got to be combined, as Sue Gordon you know, alluded to from the get-go, it's got to be combined with the other disciplines, with the other intents to frankly provide uh, a much better picture for what we're doing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. And I'll give you uh, one more chance. If you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up today's session. Sure. The, the final point that I want to touch on is what undergirds everything that I described today. And, and I'm very proud of it. It's the people at NGA. Um, our director has made a very strong point about saying people first, then mission always. He has absolutely put his money where his mouth is, and I think our agency is really responding to that and following his lead. And so as we move forward, I have to tell you, I just, despite COVID, despite all the challenges, I continue to be just absolutely amazed by the quality of our people, their initiative, uh, their ingenuity, uh, their ability to be able to come up with creative solutions to these problems. And everything I just described, uh, again, was a bit more operationally focused, uh, but fundamentally it starts all with a focus and a direction on our people, investing in our people, taking care of our people, uh, and then making sure that they are postured to be able to do uh, our important mission. Um, and so with that said, John, again, I'm very, very grateful uh, for this opportunity and I wish everybody a, a wonderful holiday season. Well, thank you so much, Charlie, and thank you for sharing uh, your candid insights.
with us this morning. I'm sure it's been very informative for everyone who's been able to join us. And for everyone online watching, thank you uh, for attending today. And once again, thank you to SAIC for being the uh, sponsor for this program. On behalf of the INSA team, I'd like to thank all of our attendees and speakers and sponsors uh, for the support over the entire uh, year. When we pivoted to virtual programming back in April, um, there was a lot of uncertainty, uh, but it, we knew it was vitally important to stay connected uh, and to keep a dialogue going between the public and private sector. And looking back, it's been a really great year and we're proud to have helped shape discussions on many issues, especially uh, on remote work and clearance reform, and importantly, how the IC can build to the future. Uh, looking ahead, we have a really exciting uh, new year uh, lineup planned with a jam-packed January, uh, including a number of the service intelligence chiefs. And as Charlie uh, mentioned, uh, Major General Leia Lauterbach, who's the intelligence director for uh, our newest service, US Space Force, will be joining us on the 6th of January uh, for a discussion. And the following week, we will welcome NSA's Rob Joyce, who's currently serving as the special US liaison officer at the US Embassy in London, who'll be talking to us about the importance of the US-UK partnership and the challenges we jointly face with that uh, uh, critical partner. On January 27th, uh, we'll welcome the Director of Naval Intelligence, Vice Admiral Jeffrey Tressler, uh, to the program. And we have others as well lined up. You can find out about these and all of our events uh, at our website, www.insaonline.org. Um, when the webinar ends, there will be a short survey that pops up. We ask you, please take a few moments to complete it and let us know how we did. We do read these and uh, value your input. And this concludes today's program. From all of us at INSA, uh, stay healthy, uh, stay safe, have a wonderful holiday season and new year. And we look forward to seeing you in January. Out here. <laughs>